don't want to glorify killing somebody. I was just doing my job. The killing will come second. To this day now, I am scarred for the things that I have done. You probably know me as the guy that held the world's longest sniper kill. But what if there is a different story? United 175, New York. We have some problems over here right now. And we might have a hijack over here, two of them. Breaking news today from the PA Newswire. Reports are just coming in of an explosion at Liverpool Street Station here in London. Everyone's just asking what's happened, what's happened. All we're being told is it's a major inch and the whole of the London oh underground is now shut. Now hearing reports that a bus building. has been uh, ripped apart in an explosion in central London. I gave the order for British forces to take part in military action in Iraq. American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. My name is Craig Harrison, and I served 23 years in the British Army as a sniper. I completed a total of 10 tours in Bosnia, Kosovo, Iraq, and Afghanistan. I survived being shot in the head, blown up by multiple IEDs, and I was hunted in the UK by ISIS. I now suffer from suicidal thoughts every single day. Let's take it back to the beginning. There's an old saying, Cheltenham is where old people go to die. Well, guess where I was fucking born. We lived in a block of flats above a chip shop, and next door, let's call him Steve. Right, we, Steve, little kid, little ginger hair kid he was, and oh, we were the same age. And his mum was fucking, kind of weird. The flat below us caught on fire and then we all got evacuated and everyone was outside and my mum must have gone, where's Craig? Fuck, I've left him in the flat. So the fire brigade come up and got me out and as I was walking out the door, Steve had his back towards me, he was looking to the road and as he turned around, he had a sign around his neck saying, I must not say the word fuck on it. And I read that, I was like that. I was going, but his mum used to make him do it. And his mum used to make it wear it to school. And then his mum used to tell the headmaster at the school, if he ever takes it off, tell me, and I'll reprimand him when he comes home. You know, I must not say the word fuck on this plaque. Yeah. And it was a cardboard bit of like a cornflake packet on the back of it. Yeah, I remember, yeah, funny, funny, funny. He's probably a wealthy billionaire somewhere. Do you know what I mean? If he laughs, he feels guilty laughing. If he's having a good time or if he lets himself enjoy himself, he feels guilty. The word guilty comes up every single day, goodness knows how many times a day, because he feels guilty. And that guilt is where he will think about the lads. Fast forward a few years to when I was 15. I realised that Cheltenham didn't have any opportunities for a person like me. So I joined the Household Cavalry in the British Army to make my granddad proud of me. And that was it. Little country boy Craig was about to experience city life. And I didn't hold back. It was carnage to filling in bouncers to prize fighting gypsies. I went so off the rails that I went AWOL from the British Army 
and hiked overseas to join the Foreign Legion. Every week, more than a hundred young men from all over the world arrive at Marseille to offer their lives for France. The contract is simple. You give the Legion your body and they will protect you from yourself. Now you've got to think, I'm what, 18 at the time. Um, we had the highest AWOL rate in the British Army at one point in the Household Cavalry. Most of them say to me, I can't cope any longer with my environment and with the world around me. So I come and I give you my skin. I give you my blood. You, you do what you want with me, said the Legioner. But please, love me. Most people who come here, they've got nowhere else to go. This is probably your last chance. It used to keep you in a cage as well. And then you take you out, put you back in there the next day, then and so on and so on. And then you get interviewed. After three weeks of medicals, aptitude tests and interrogations, the successful one in three is issued with a uniform. And I was quite up front with them. And I said I was AWOL from the British Army. And they went, no, 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 we don't take you. They sent me back. So I was hungry, I had no money. I thought, fuck it, I'll walk back to England. What's the worst that could happen? I was freezing cold, I was wet. I would uh, walked through a plough field, and do you know when you walk through mud, you end up getting moon boots, don't you? Yeah, I had that, I was fucking caked. Well, anyway, I remember I said, fuck it, I'm just going to walk to the train station, jump the train, go back to London, hand myself back in, and the jobs are good. And so I did that, and I remember a truck going past, flashing his lights, thought nothing of it, and he must have turned around, and he came up next to me. He opened his door and he said, where are you going, mate? I said, I've just gone to the train station. He goes, you, you look cold. I says, yeah, mate, I'm cold. I'm fucking hungry as well. And he goes, jump in. <laughs> so I went, OK, then. so I jumped in. And he kept going on about abs. And he goes, oh, yeah, I love abs. You know, I do a lot of sit-ups and all that. And I was looking at him. It was just a fat trucker, you know. And I thought, what the fuck? And he, going, have you got... and he said to me, have you got abs? I said, yeah, I'm all right, I'm all right. And I sat there, fucking freezing. And he didn't have the heating on in the cab. So I was cold even more. And he said, you look cold. And he goes, and I felt like I said, you're making me fucking cold. Stick the fucking heating on. Anyway, we, he said, why don't you stay a night at my place? And I went, um, yeah, that's fine, mate. As long as I get a lift in the morning to the chip shop. And he said, I'll give you some money for doing some cleaning for me. I said, what do you want me to do? He goes, you can clean my oven. And I went, fair enough, the cleaning oven. I'll get some money out of him. So I went to his house and it turned out he lived in a static caravan, right, on the site where the trucks were. And he parked his truck up, went into his caravan. Everything was melted. Everything. Pictures of family were all distorted and the frame was melted. Videos and CDs were melted. His, his video player was melted. His telly was fucked. The microwave was melted. It didn't even have a door on it, you know. And the amount of radiation probably coming out of that microwave was being horrendous. And he goes, um, i got some spare clothes. I'll wash your clothes for you. You don't want to go back to London dirty, do you? And I said, no, not really. I want to go back clean and dry and he said take your clothes off and I said I'll change in here so I changed in the shower and he gave me these um, this is God's truth is it he gave me these uh, pair of shorts or a pair of lycra shorts like running lycra ones these shorts wouldn't even fit a fucking two-year-old these shorts and I was trying to put them on and I was willing them to fit I was going, oh, they've got to fit, they've got to fit, they've got to fit. They're not going to fit. And I looked at the floor and said, it's going to have to be the Lycra. So I took them off, put the Lycra one on, and then um, put this white T-shirt on. And I sat opposite him on this table. And he said to me, do you like porn? And I thought, yeah, everyone likes porn, mate. Yeah, porn, porn's porn. And he goes, oh, watch this. I like this, my favourite. So he got this fucked up, melted fucking videotape, put it in his fucked up, melted video player and he he pressed the fucked up play button and then these these two lesbians came on and uh, they were doing what they do and I was praying praying not to get a fucking hard on 
because I had like those shorts on, I was fucking praying. I was just thinking, when, they, when these lesbians were on the screen, I was looking behind them, looking at the scenery, trying not to look what they were doing. And, um, he, and it didn't help him going, oh, look at this, look at this bit. This is the favorite bit. And I just said to him, I said, uh, do we, what do you want me to clean? And he goes, oh, you can, the oven, I want the oven clean. I said, okay then. So I started cleaning the oven. He goes, why don't you take your t-shirt off? You don't want it to get dirty, do you? And I'm, and I'm bending over in these lycra shorts. But people must, people must think, what the fuck are you doing? Mate, I was cold, I was wet, I was fucking hungry. I was very, very tired. So I stood up and he gave me a Budweiser. And I remember it was chicken in red wine sauce. That's what he gave me for dinner. Smashed it in. And then he goes, right, time for bed. And I said, yeah, nice one. So I leant over on the sofa and he goes, no, I've got a spare room. So I went to the room and it was just one big double bed. And I thought, he was right behind me. I thought, this is, and my head went down. I thought, this is fucking. And as my head went down, I looked in the corner. My clothes were just bunged in the corner. They weren't even in the fucking washing machine. And I said to him, I said, uh, my clothes. And he says, yeah, I haven't got a washing machine. I said, but you said you had a washing machine. He goes, nah, nah, I haven't got a washing machine. And in my head, I'm thinking that probably melted as well. You know what I mean? And as I turned around, he grabbed my bollocks and he said, do you want some fun with these? Do you want some fun? I fucking nutted him and he fell back. But as he fell back, he's hit his head on the sink and uh, he's laid on the floor. And I thought, fuck, fuck. This is how death happens. Do you know what I mean? How am I going to explain this? You know, my clothes are in the corner, piss wet through. I've got Lycro shorts on with a dodgy crop t-shirt that doesn't fit me with a dead body. How the fuck? With porn playing on the fucking telly, even fucking worse, you know? So I, um, I legged it out at the, um, at the caravan. And as I'm running down the fucking road, I stopped and I thought, what? In my head, I'm going, what am I doing? What am I doing? I got Lycra shorts on, a white t-shirt doesn't fit me. I've got no shoes and socks on and I'm running down a fucking main road. I'm worse off than I was when I was in the fucking side of the road walking up to the train station. So I, um, I legged it back and he was coming round. He was going, ah, ah. So I kicked him in the bollocks as hard as I fucking could and he fucking squealed. I got his wallet and managed to nick about 50, 50, 60 quid off him. And then I grabbed my clothes and I fucking legged it and I managed to run and uh, got to the train station and I, I bought a ticket. It was only like 20 odd quid to buy a ticket and I managed to buy some food with the money as well. Uh, made my way back to Knightsbridge and I handed myself in. Bet you were glad to be back. Yeah, I'm glad to be back, yeah. After coming home, serving my time, I decided to buckle down and I carried on serving three tours in Bosnia, two tours in Kosovo. Do you know what people say, what's your worst tour? Um, I reckon Kosovo was, not Afghan or um, Iraq or anything like that, but for, for um, deceased people, um, mass graves, digging up the mass graves, um, putting bodies in coffins and stuff like that. Um, yeah, uh, you know, seeing babies in skips and stuff like that. and gunfights in the town and city. Yeah, I reckon it was uh, definitely Kosovo for that, yeah. No! It's not a particularly uh, nice scene, it's quite gruesome. Uh, we believe that uh, the men were out looking for cattle and uh, while we've reached this location, there've been three of them have been knifed, and one has been shot. The Serbians had um, killed all the women, uh, um, threw them in the lake, weighted down, and they were all so. So if you drain the lake, there'd be like blooms in the water, just um, about that much from the top of the surface. The sergeant at the time did the whole troop and said, "Who's a good swimmer?" Um, me and Ronnie put our hands up and he said, well, you need to swim out there and uh, we didn't have a boat. So we, uh, we swam out there and uh, I remember pulling the hair of this blonde lady and her scalp came off. So I had to go underneath her arm, but then her skin came off and drag it through 
uh, to the to the shore, and I did it about about four times, I think. I did it, and, and Ronnie done it as well. The morgue was so overwhelmed they had used the refrigeration ices containers with the refrigeration units on to put the bodies in. I remember a power lad being on there, and he said, "Yeah, the ones at the bottom." So we went right to the bottom. We went, "No, no, no, that that one." We opened it, and they all came out. I came back off my second tour of Iraq. I was going to see a friend of mine in Bedfordshire and I had a camper van and uh, I said fuck it I'll just drive down and I said I won't stay at your place mate just as long as I've got your driveway I'll keep on the driveway and he says yeah not a problem and he said I'll meet you in the pub and he never tipped up so I was on my own and I remember these pair of legs walking in and I was looking at his legs and they walked into the bar and she had long brown hair and I like long brown hair and beautiful beautiful woman and it took the, my breath away it's called the cross keys this pub was and her friend was playing the slot machine and i could see a nudge her friend when i walked in oh look at him and as i did that he we just made eye contact and i said to my friend oh my god he's just seen me do that really embarrassed and then he well craig walked up to my friend and i said uh, do you know it's uh, it's addictive gambling and then we just started talking and his, his sense of humour just, it shone through. I mean, he, such a funny guy, such a funny guy. Um, I mean, I, my stomach used, used to hurt with laughter. He's, yeah, it's just, and I, yeah, I was obviously as we start talking, you'll realise that, that I do miss that side of Craig, you know, the, the, the funny and the, the belly aches and things like that, but yeah. Here he is. Jim, what is... Doing? I've been feeling right today or yesterday, too many demons in my head. But, um, the workout shifts it to one side for a while. So if you do feel crap at all, or you feel down, go for a walk, get some fresh air, go for a jog. Got Betsy with me. Always got her with me, keep me company do something just to shift them demons aside for a while because it does you a world of good it does me good as well a dicker basically is a person that is uh, tracking you keeping your eye on you keeping track of every movement that you do but we had to change the name dicker to scout we wondered why because it was demoralizing towards the the enemy yeah and we thought all right yeah so we ended up calling him scouts instead of dickers every time you stop you dig a foxhole next to the left hand side of your vehicle all right that was the sop so everyone stops dig a hole left hand side of your vehicle and we'd done that and then the mortars come in and we got told just to take cover I remember holding my body on like this, and I remember being like this, going, da -da 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 saying that to myself, da -da 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 -da. and the mortars is coming in. What they used to do, they used to um, get a water vessel with metal on top, put metal on the bottom of the water vessel, punch you a hole, go, let the water drip out, so when the metal touches, the mortars would go off. Everywhere we were, the motorbike followed this motorbike followed us, and it was a dicker, basically, or scout. And uh, we had to take him out, we had to take him out, and I got the green light to take him out. Nervous, you know, but you've got to remember that um, a sniper is not out to kill, that's not his first objective. His first objective were to, um, to gather lifetime information of the battlefield you know, to get as much information as possible. And then you'd go back with that information and they'd give you permission to take that target out or keep that target alive, whatever they decide, really. I got the green light to do it. And I must have hit the motorbike because he fell off, all right? And, uh, and then I shot again. Um, I hit him here, hit him here, and I went up to inspect the body, 
and he was gasping for air and he passed away and he had his throttle of his motorbike was stuck in the sand so his motorbike was revving its tits off he had an AK strapped to it um, he had a radio on him which was tuned into the Taliban and he was, they were still talking trying to get hold of him and he had loads of maps on him as well and the maps were of the Maysan desert and he had pinpointed where we'd been all the fucking time and where the mortar was being set and everything um, so then I've killed someone you know I've done it I've killed someone I'm thinking I'm in trouble here I've just fucking shot someone what do I do and I remember sitting on the, my cam cot you know and my head down I'm thinking fuck I'm in trouble This is the naivety of, a, of someone that doesn't know army life. You're not going to get hurt. You're not at the front of it, are you, babe? And it'd be, it'd be like, no, no, it's fine. We're going where it's okay. The fighting's not so bad there. It's calmed down. We're just there to sort of tidy up and keep it amicable. And I'd be like, okay. But I knew, I knew, but he was protecting me. Pidgeot was an outpost in Iraq, in Basra. Literally 10 minutes from Basra Palace. And if you walked it, it would take you 10 minutes. But if you drove there, it would take you two hours because you got fucking smashed. It was just an outpost to protect the prisoners that were in there. You know, the insurgents that everyone's caught were put in there. And it was only 18 people there. You know, a mixture of clerks doing admin work, um, obviously the chefs, and obviously fighting soldiers as well, and myself. When we went there, and I remember being in the back with my gun like that, in the back of this vehicle, because they were attacking from the up, and the, the mortar doors were open. The driver's warrior door was down, but he had a gap like this to look through. And then I remember it stopped. And I looked at my number two and I said, what the fuck's going on? There's only me and him in the back. And I said, what the fuck is going on? And we were like, I don't know. So should we open the door? And all we could hear off the wagon. And we could hear dunk, dunk. We thought, what the fuck? The wagon would rock. Um, and then I looked at the commander, because the commander was up and his legs were bleeding. And I thought, fuck, you know, his legs are bleeding. It wasn't his blood, um, it was the driver's blood. He had been shot in the head through this little gap and um, his, his back of his skull was gone and his brain was, and I was holding, I crawled forward and I was holding his head like that. And when number two, he's gone mate, he's gone, he's gone, leave him, he's gone. We can't do anything. And then, um, I told the commander, I said, well, we need to be out of here or either abandon this fucking vehicle because we're sitting ducks or we need to fucking be dragged, you know, and it, luckily we weren't too far away from the PJOC. I think my number two got out to give covering fire. I stayed in the vehicle and then he got back in and another vehicle came behind us and pushed us all the way to the PJOC. Yeah, and we got there and we got out and we said, well, clear this vehicle, clear this vehicle. And as we cleared it, there was two RPG rounds stuck. Because uh, you have reactive armor, or oh, bar armor, that's why they call it bar armor. It's like a, just like a fence on the side, and it's got that much gap from the bulk of the, uh, the wagon, and this gap, and then there's the bar armor. And there was RPG rounds stuck in there, fizzing away, um, because they hadn't had time to arm, because um, they arm over a certain distance, the old ones do. The PJOC was, uh, yeah, the p -drop was different. They tried to overrun us many a time, many a time. And the reason why they wanted to overrun us and get us out of there is so they can free the prisoners that, like I said before, you know, free the prisoners that they've caught. 
because there were some high ranking guys in there um, but it used to be 11 o'clock at night guarantee 11 o'clock at night to about 5 in the morning it was just fucking full on fighting full on fucking fighting uh, it was horrendous I didn't know there was many insurgents out there Oh, well, there was one night that um, we thought we were going to get overrun um, and we had the chefs on the guns uh, we had fucking all sorts going on up there we were using cooking oil instead of gun oil we ran out to lubricate the jimpies up there stuff like that you know um, lads pissing on the barrels trying to cool them down and fucking all sorts going on but as snipers you're more precision shot you know, um, so you get beyond a waffle. It was fucking. That's what it was like. Over a hundred. Yeah, fucking easy, easy. And they would come from north, east, south, west. They would come from everywhere. They usually come from the same place because there was a, like a canal with steep banks going. They used to come up from there, but they would come from everywhere. It was just getting too much and I remember me and my number two climbed down the ladder from the sniper hide to get onto the roof because we were trying to ship positions and uh, I said I'll be there in a minute mate and he went up he said you're right I said yeah I mean just a minute and then I phoned Tanya up and I said to her I goes uh, I love you you know that's all I said I love you she goes hi sweetheart I love you and she said, what's all that noise? I said, nothing, that's fine. I just wanted to ring you, said, I love you. There's something going on. I will ring you in the morning. I promise you I'll ring you in the morning. And she goes, Craig, you're scaring me. What's all that noise? I said, I'll be fine. And then he top of the stairs, goes, Craig, come on. I said, I've got to go, sweetheart. And I put the phone down. I get upset. <laughs> I just, um, yeah, shit day, shit, shit, it's funny, we got, um, I got an accommodation for that, but my number two didn't, we worked as a team. Cavalry Regiment have today proudly received their operational medals after a gruelling tour of duty in Afghanistan. The Household Cavalry Regiment have played a vitally important role in Helmand, especially in Musakala and Babaji. The Major General gave me it, they call it a big parade, everything, and certain people got awards and I got an accommodation. The guy in charge of the PJOC, he was a colonel, he wrote me and my number two a letter. The letter said at the bottom, you earn a credit to the word sniper and we sort of looked at each other and go fucking right we are I left there and went on leave I went on R&R &R from the PJOC so I was battle worn and it's weird because when you go on R&R &R, you fly home and then you have two weeks at home I think I was different then you know just it's, it's weird you're taken away from a battle zone you had no time to fucking really relax and calm down before you go home and I was still still there and uh, and they left it they pulled out the PJOC because they figured out it was just a fucking waste of time and they left everything there the kitchen all the gym kit um, they left the uh, all the computers there the TVs everything they just fucking left all we did was run the vehicles and fucking left <laughs> These are Craig's medals. I'm proud of them, but Craig, he just, he doesn't like to wear them, unfortunately. Because what has it achieved? What has it achieved? Absolutely fuck all. People have died, 
amputees, injured people, mental health, everything. That's what it's achieved, mental health. That's what it's achieved. He took 16 lads out there. Um, the injuries that obviously they came back with or didn't even return back out with. Devastated Craig, that's the last thing he wanted to see. Um, they were young lads, I mean, like, I think they probably started at 19, I think the oldest was 26. So Craig blamed himself a lot for the way the, the lads had come back, but it's, it didn't matter how much I said to him, it's not, it's not your fault. He took it so personally, if he could have gone out there and fought them himself without anybody, he would have done. But yeah, Craig carried a lot of guilt. Everyone knows me for breaking the world record for the longest sniper kill. I was on an op in the north of Musakala in a place called Talijan in Afghan. It's in Helmand province. And I was on a patrol and the patrol was going into this village. It was my job to give overwatch. And in this village they were going to was full of Taliban, full of Taliban. And I could see them all queuing up for the attack. And uh, I had a radio with me and the interpreter was on the radio saying that the Taliban can see the patrol coming in and they were about to strike the attack. And they're going to wait until they get into a kill box. And what a kill box is, is an area of the battlefield where there's no escape. No escape at all, there's no cover, there's no this, there's no that. And um, they, took, they can cause the max devastation. From the distance I could see um, a glint and I thought, what the fuck's that? And I was checking everything. So, you know, as a sniper, you've got to observe and what's going on. The patrol's still coming forward. And I could see um, a bloke on a radio. Um, I'm on four mag now. I know what he's doing. He's um, talking to the Taliban, calling it in, ready to, uh, to wait until he gets his kill zone or kill box. So I radio to the patrol, say I'm going to open fire. Um, it's me firing. OK, stand by, stand by and then I fired a shot and I saw it drop and then I turned my magnification down, fired another one, turned it down, fired another one, another one. And it took six seconds for the flight of that bullet to hit the compound wall. I put him back on full mag and the, the guy's head was down. Um, I couldn't see him anymore. I knew I didn't hit him. And then the radio went quiet and I went to the interpreter, what they're saying. And he said, he, he can't help you anymore. I'm getting shot at from somewhere. And that place was for me, right? So the patrol's going in and he gets in this kill zone and hell's let loose. Then I noticed something on my right side and I looked up and um, I could see a guy next to um, a pump. And um, I shot this guy because um, I thought he was a marker for the Taliban to go around him, to go behind me. Because in reality, as a sniper, you take one to three shots and then get the fuck out, you know? I was, I was shooting everything on the top of that ridge line. And uh, so I shot this guy, he was 675 yards away, and I'm, I shot him. He fell down, and it turned out he wasn't a marker. What he had done, he knocked the head off the oil um, water pump, and he flooded the irrigation field. Now my vehicles are stuck, the wheel spinning in the mud. And next thing I knew, I could see spray, and I could hear in the distance. And I thought, where the fuck's that coming from? Machine gun fire. And I looked at my lad through the scope, and they're all on the floor. Uh, some on the water, some in the vehicle, crouching down. And looking at ting, 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 and it hits the vehicles. And I'm like, ah, fucking hell. So everywhere I engaged a Taliban, I check him again to make sure no one's alive. Check in. Check this guy over here. He's, he's down still. The only place I didn't check is in the far distance where that dicker was. Oh, scout. Um, so I looked um, for Mag, and there were two guys laying down. Um, one a uh, PKM machine gun, uh, it's a Russian made belt fed machine gun or barrel fed, whatever you want to change it to. Uh, the other guy was belt feeding it, feeding him, and he was kneeling. The other guy was laying down. And I thought, I need to do this. Now, I knew the, 
I didn't know the distance because when I lasered it with my laser binos, four red lines would just come up. Laser it again, four red lines. So it's beyond my laser binos as well. So I put it on my magnification, I put it on 15. So they're little blips now. And I fired one shot, it carried on going, carried on going. And what I would do is put it to four mag and turn it down again, just to see what was going on. I missed. And then the guy stood up and then I shot again and I hit him. Um, hit him here, he fell backwards and he's on the floor and then the other guy must have panicked and he stood up. Now I fired third shot and I went one banana, two banana, three banana, I moved across went bang, one banana, two. So now I've got two bullets in the air at the same time, right, uh, next to each other, not behind each other because if they were behind each other this bullet would travel faster because it's breaking the slipstream with this bullet. Yeah, so it all fuck up basically. So I put them level next level three seconds apart from each other. Third one missed, and the fourth one hit him on the side here. And the only reason why I knew why I hit him because I had to go and try and get that weapon uh, because it's a PKM high prized weapon that the Taliban had, and I didn't want it to go recycled into enemy hands. So I tried to take it before I got there though, an Apache tipped up. Uh, Apache longbow and where there's one there's two and one tipped up over here somewhere because we were in a contact for a long time. He lasered it because I went like that and he lasered it and it came back that it was 2,475 meters away and uh, then we drove over to the bodies the rifle had gone and it turned out behind them behind that compound it was like a rat run um, where they grabbed the weapon and they just fucking scurried away um, but the two bodies were there and they turned out to be uh, two Taliban leaders um, and they were orchestrating the whole attack onto this patrol itself. And I remember to this day, I was laying in bed and we had got a call and they, someone, they had said, go and get the papers, Craig's in the paper. And I was like, oh, God, you're in the paper, Craig? And I remember opening it. And my name was there, my face was there, Tanya's name was there, my daughter's name was there, my dog's name everything, where I was born, where I was bred, everything, everything was in the papers, my whole life fucking story basically. And um, first Tanya said, Oh my God, and he said what? And I said, She's got a gut feeling, you know, she's like psychic with her gut. She trusts that, it's, it's true, you know, and she went, um, That can't be right Craig, you're supposed to be protected because of your job. And then a few hours later we got a call from um, uh, from camp, they said that there'd been a mistake. The MOD had released it and he's n without it's been censored. So some retired colonel, fat retired colonel sitting at a desk going, yeah, that can go, didn't bother doing his job. We had people that come rushing around to the house. We were told that we had to pack up stuff because we weren't going to be staying there, leave behind, you know, what we could and just take an overnight bag sort of thing. We started getting death threats. Um, the, it, was, it was reported in the papers that they wanted to cut my head off. I was, gosh. I was so scared. I was on a, a mission and it was a place called Minden, which is the top of um, Musakala. And they're putting a new PB up there, a new patrol base. And next thing you know, we had shit coming from the right. Everyone was going, get back, get back, reverse, reverse. I got on the net and I was going, contact, contact, contact. And when you say contact on the net, the net goes dead you're in control of that net. I got shot in my chest, in my body armour, and I had a thing called a man bag, and it kept all my magazines in it, and it went straight through the strap. I was firing, and then the box got hit, so it squashed the box, so I couldn't, I, I was trying to rinse it open, and I did that, I got shot in the helmet. When I fell out, and Cliff, my driver, grabbed me, dislocated his shoulder, he pulled me back in, and then I came around 
and I don't know what happened. Once everything stopped, I got out of my vehicle and I threw up because um, I had really bad concussion. They were going to cazzy back me out, but because we were so far forward and this hot was and it was a hot DZ, they weren't going to land. So we had luckily we had um, a medical vehicle, which is about two miles away. So we got to there. I stayed the night in the back of the ambulance, uh, throwing up um, everything. And they said you got bad concussion. There's three stages to a bullet. So you get supersonic when it leaves, you get transonic, and you get subsonic. So the supersonic, that's the bang coming out, breaking the sound barrier. And then it, then, it's, then it wobbles in the air. And if it could talk to itself, it goes, oh, I need to sort myself out. Then it sorts itself out. And because it's sorted itself out, it loses velocity, then it goes subsonic. So that bullet was going supersonic from the distance that it fired at me. This is a Mark uh, 6 Alpha helmet. And I think on my tour, um, they went out with the Mark 7 uh, Alpha helmet, which is more sort of like the American style, which is cut out. If anything, shot your helmet. So basically the bullet's designed to go round and come out, and which it did. Um, as you can see there, there's the in. And if I roll it over, there's the out. It's funny really, because they never gave me a a Mark 7 helmet to go on tour with because my head was too big and it didn't have my size. So if I had a new helmet, I'd be dead now. Without that, I'd be dead. And we carried on with the mission. And then three weeks later after that, I got blown up. It's funny, I remember the date because I looked at my watch, you know, and I thought, come on, we need to go. Hi there, me again. Um, people have been asking me what do I use as a sidearm. Well, when I was in the army, we had the old-fashioned uh, Browning handgun, uh, but it was too archaic, so the uh, the army upgraded to um, the Glocks, uh, which were pretty damn accurate, and they got rid of the Brownings. Myself, out here, I got a handgun. I got this one here. Yep, this is a HNK 45 HNK style. Oh, yeah. I go to bed and I think about it and when I wake up in the morning I think about it. It doesn't leave my mind. It doesn't leave my mind at all. You know, when I'm having a really shit day I always think best ways I can do it, today's the day, today's the day. I'm usually at the rear and the front call sign stopped. And I said to Cliff, my driver, just stop here, like, you know, and I jumped out and I ran over to the front call sign and I said, look, what's going on? Why aren't we moving forward? You know, it's half four. You know, at five o'clock, half five, it's pitch fucking black here. And there's no way in hell that I want to be in fucking night because we're in a prime location. And the guy said to me, he goes, look, Craig, he said, I've got, got a bad feeling about this. You know, I've got kids at home. Um, and I don't feel comfortable leaving. I've got leading, I've got a bad feeling. And I said, yeah, no worries, I'll lead. But I said to Cliff, come mate, we're going. And we scooted around all the vehicles. And I wasn't gonna go for the village because the village had a compound wall around it. And there was so many, we call them VPs, vulnerable points, like corners, everything where we could get attacked. So I said, what we do, we'll just drive around the village. Adds another 15 minutes onto our journey. What's 15 minutes, you know? And as we did that, I hit a, an anti-tank mine on the right side of the vehicle. Which my driver wore, Cliff wore the majority of it. And I got blown out uh, the left side and I laid on the floor. But I was trying to crawl, I was trying to find Cliff. I couldn't find him anywhere. And every time I went, my arms would slip down and the pain was fucking horrendous. Uh, they looked everywhere and they couldn't find him. And because my vehicle was covered in sand from the right side, he, he covered him up. And the only reason they found him was because the blood was coming out. And they said, oh yeah, oh, he's here, he's here, I've got him. He was still in the vehicle and the lads were looking in the vehicle and they still couldn't find him. And then the lads got to me 
um, evacuated me out, stuck me in morphine and then flew me out on the Chinook and I didn't know about my hips at the time um, but I remember laying in Bastion and um, they knew about my brain because they give you a scan and I thought my arms are killing me and they said no you're fine and I kept complaining I kept saying to them my arms are killing me my arms are killing me and they were going no you're fine you're fine finally a nurse come over and she goes what we're going to do is give you an x-ray just to clear it off and this is two days into it and me complaining and um, they found out that I put me at radius from scaphoid my wrists in both arms and they turned around I can hear them at the end of my bed going how do we miss this and I couldn't move my arms on both arms I was totally incapacitated totally and I had to rely on Tanya to get me dressed even what on the arse do you know what I mean and to go for a wee and a poo to eat I had to rely on her and she, for six weeks she was looking after me um, but yeah it was, it was shit 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 uh, and then, then they um, took the casts off and I went to physio and uh, they gave me 10 press ups and uh, they said, right, your next flight's out in three days. Do you know, I sat in my car and I cried. And I thought, I've got to tell Tanya this. You know, and then I went home and I said, oh, I'm going back out. And she just broke down, massively broke down. And I didn't feel right in my head. My head didn't feel right. Um, as in, I didn't feel 100%. And it was like that explosion that fucking happened, that one incident um, that's when my PTSD started I was rock bottom it was in the evening rock bottom had a gun it was a HMK 45 big lump it was um, Tanya wasn't there, she was in England. She went away for a birthday party. She was away for about three weeks. And um, I just sat at the kitchen table, loaded the gun, put it in my mouth, put it in my head, put it in my mouth, uh, trying to click in. It wasn't loaded, I was just clicking, find a way to put it. Finally, I just put the magazine in, put one round in, cocked it, put it in my mouth. Where the kitchen table was, I say he was, you know, the couch and Betsy was on the back of it looking at me like she always used to do. But she looked at me in a different way this time and she turned her head to the side and the other side and I just stared at her. I put the gun out of my mouth, I loaded it up, put it on the kitchen table. I grabbed her and I just fucking cried and cried and cried and cried. And when people do, you hear people, oh yeah, such and such commit suicide, they commit And I always think, how the fuck have they done it and I can't? How the fuck can they do it and I can't? And people say it's a coward's way out. Probably is. Probably is. It all takes, takes a lot of bottle as well, I think. A lot of bottle. When the night's empty, you know, I'm quiet, I lay in bed and I can hear the voice. So I put a podcast on and it drowns it out. But it's funny because when that earphone falls out, the voice wakes me up. I'm still here. Still battling on. I'm off to bed now. Um, I look forward to sleeping, but I don't look forward to the night. Um, gonna plug myself in. Got my headphones. Gonna plug myself in to my podcast and um, see the guys in the morning.
hear a voice in my head that says I'm valuable and it just repeats itself, you vile, you vile, you vile. And it happened when I got blown up. When I laugh, it gets louder. Laugh, laugh, it gets louder and louder and louder. So I don't bother fucking laughing or joking around anymore because I'd rather have it dull in my head than full blown in my face. The nightmares, what missions I've done, people I've killed, stuff like that. Um, bodies that I've seen, mass graves I've dug up, uh, children that I've seen killed everything it just all bombards you at once and you end up getting a panic attack and you feel sometimes the duvet's wrapping around you and you can't get out of it you know so i don't sleep i'm in the gym at half one in the morning you know and i go to work and sit in my van outside work waiting to the gates to open at six this is fucking crazy all right we're at the gym now Gonna have some fun, it's gonna throw some weight to it. That's what it's all about. I got nightmares in my head, I fear that the thoughts build up until I can't hear. That my mind fills up into a creature and it haunts me somewhere much deeper. I got nightmares in my head, I fear that the thoughts build up until I can't hear. That my mind fills up into a creature and it haunts me somewhere much deeper. I think about bad things, it's my problem. I'm thinking now. Then we get negative thoughts. Just take them through the mirror, just I look in my eyes and I just fucking hate it. I've got low esteem on myself anyway. Looking in the mirror, just fucking hate it. Fucking come on, Craig. Fucking sad. I choose the route we chose to get out of that village, get out of that situation. And it doesn't matter what people say, you know, it's not your fault, Craig. You could have gone somewhere else and been blown up. But it's me. It's my brain. It's where my brain thinks. Da -da -da -da. You know, and I say sorry to him. I say sorry. Sorry, Cliff. Sorry for ruining your armor career. You know, I'm sorry for choosing that route. Hope he's well, hope he's well. So PTSD is, um, we classed as a, an anxiety disorder in sort of generalized terms. And there's, there's two forms of trauma. So there's simple trauma so simple trauma would be a single event. So somebody, for example, would have a good um, uh, sound, emotional, mental foundation. So like they've got a good, um, decent amount of savings in the bank account, then there's a single event that happens. That could be incredibly serious, but it's a single event. It could be a car crash or an assault or something like that. So effectively, there's a huge withdrawal on their emotional savings. Um, but they have enough resources to be able to build back up so that that would be a, a simple trauma the other would be a repeated uh, trauma and the repeated trauma is seen as complex trauma complex trauma is occurs when you know something is going to happen and you can't stop it from happening so you do everything you can do to try and stop it so you you might laugh you might cry you might fight you might run away you do everything you can but it keeps coming and it's complex then because you've used all of your resources, you've used all, all your bank account and you've gone into a huge withdrawal. And the most frequent conclusion from that complex trauma is, well, what's the problem then? Oh, it has to be me. So the primary thing with a simple trauma is fear. However, with complex trauma, there's a lot more shame. So the, the symptoms you'd look for for PTSD would be five symptoms. You look at uh, hypervigilance, which is demonstrated by somebody always being on edge. Person we're talking about, for example, so lots of scanning, so lots of looking backwards and forwards and just checking perimeters and things like that. So hypervigilance, um, sleep disturbance, so that's often nightmares or night terrors, um, intrusive 
images or intrusive thoughts. So those can be all sorts of things, suicidal things, or there'd be flashbacks. The difference between a flashback and a memory is a, a flashback. I'm actually in the event and I don't know where I am currently. A memory, I'm here, but I can remember. I am. And then uh, emotional numbing. So just having no avoid and uh, avoidance. Hey, baby. Hey. What are you doing? If someone's quiet, there might be something wrong. If you haven't seen someone for a while, there might be something wrong, go and check on them. PTSD, it is a thing and it goes on and do people do suffer in silence, they don't want to open up because it's, they, they regard it as a stigma. It's not, we're trying to break that wall down to say no, it's, it's okay to talk. Hey Mr H, hey. what are you doing? Making a whistle today. Making a whistle. <laughs> I'm in the woods today just to get a bit of a breather, clear my head a bit. I don't know if, you, if anyone out there does what I do, but I wear a mask sometimes uh, just to put a happy spell on everything. Uh, but it does slip sometimes and um, people start noticing it. So it's nice just to get away, take the mask off, vent a little bit and um, recharge, put it back on and get out there again, you know? Um, but it's good to talk and you need to talk and I've learned that you need to talk. You know, you can wear the masks all your life and then not talk and get worse and worse, but you need to talk. Morning. It's another day. Another night wild camping. You just can't beat it. It's living the dream. My Saturday evening, watching the sun go down on a beautiful beach. It's nice to clear the mind and be peaceful with the sunset. Just finished work and I thought I'd come to the woods. As you can hear, it's pretty, pretty quiet. And that's what I love about it. It's just quiet and you've got time to think and you've got time to reconnect. I left the army with CPTSD and I had no purpose, no purpose in life. That's how I felt. And to just sit there and fester, it wasn't me. I had to be, I'm a proactive kind of guy. So I decided to do something and it got to the point where I just wanted to teach. I've been teaching for the last four hours, um, survival skills, um, just preparation you know doing trial runs um, for this setup of the survival school next year but I wanted to teach people with mental health issues people that understand what I go through and understand what they go through I put myself a little citron bilingo really good Nick I'm really happy with it and uh, I'll see you in the future just put my tent up uh, ready for the school to open giving it a good air in just bought a um, little homemade forge built for weather just practicing making fletchlings. In Devon at the moment, doing some level four training. Down in Norfolk at the moment, doing some flint napping with Will Lord. He's a um, wild class and was a world class flint napper. Getting my hand in and making some arrowheads, uh, some hand axes, and some skinning tools that I could use uh, preparation uh, for teaching on the Maverick Survival School. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, it's a, he's a pleasure to work with. So um, I'll catch you soon. I a bit of shopping today thanks to my sponsor Cloud Orca. It's allowed me to buy some equipment such as roll mats, sleeping bags and also tents. I'm going to start taking bookings now uh, due to me being inundated with requests for next year. But on hold uh, until probably the end of May due to me being in hospital tomorrow. So hi all, it's the day of my hip operation to get my left one replaced. Anxious. Not allowed to take your meds, so I haven't took any. And um, amazing how much I do rely on them. I've got a thumping headache and um, anxiety is going through the roof. But it'd be good. Good to get it done. Good to get it over. Good to get rid of the Afghan thing in my head, over and done with. <laughs> Last thing to do. On my way home today, 
Um, the hips all good, they're all fine. Meds are back in my body, so I don't feel so shitty as I did, you know, the other day or yesterday. Um, but all good, all good. Um, been walking around. We went up some stairs, so I'm just waiting for my lift to go home, and then um, just the road to recovery, basically. Yeah, been giving Tanya a hard time. Not a very good patient, you know, waking up every couple of hours, but um, I'll get there. You know, it's a healing process, as they keep saying. You're healing, you're healing, it'll get better. So um, I can do the stairs, which is a bonus. Um, just don't like giving Tanya a hard time. It's not fair on her. Feeling, babe? Shit. What's the pain level? It's fucking past ten. What's your pain level at? One, minimum, ten, the highest. Twenty. <laughs> Sorry. Craig knows that I always laugh at things when he when he gets angry because it's a way of bringing his anger down because... I don't know how it helps. How does it help when I laugh when you're angry? It doesn't. It winds up being... <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> I can tell by your face you want to smile. I love her. It's more than love. More than love. You know? Every time I see her, she makes me squidgy inside. Every time. 19 years on. Sometimes when she's in a queue, she walks off to go and do something, and I watch her walk off, and I watch her walk back. I smile. And I think, I'm with that woman. I'm with that woman. I love that woman. You know, I'd die for her. I'd do anything for her. Very tanned legs, I must say. Thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we are such a loving couple. We love each other so much. 4.30 in the morning. And uh, I'm roughly six weeks post-op on my hip. And I'm back in the gym. Um, it's what I need. It's what I need for my mental health. If you are struggling, talk to someone, open up, and if it's light at the end of the tunnel, remember that. There's Betsy, 17, coming up to. Old Christmas jumper on, still going strong. Old crazy legs. Been doing a thing called EMDI with my therapist, trying to keep this depression and demons at bay. Um, and it's working for me. It takes you to that point of your PTSD, where it stems from, and then brings you back again. If anyone is struggling, ask about it. I know the NHS do it as well, so um, it's worth giving it a go. If it helps me, it might help other people. I took my first class last weekend and it was a great success. I took three lads, uh, they thoroughly enjoyed it, so did I. Well, I'm in a position now to offer three, three spaces to anyone with mental health issues, uh, veterans or civilians. Uh, to come down on the course each month. I'm lucky enough to be sponsored by a company called Cloud Orca. Bought a new storage unit today, put it together earlier on this afternoon. One's got a hammock, one's got a tent. Cool setup. Just finished my session with Ross. Um, see him every Thursday. Um, it's good to cry, scream and shout, you know, and uh, he sits and wears it, bless him. Um, but good man. I'm in Bristol today, I'm giving an after-dinner speech to over about uh, 60 people, talking about uh, my lifetime as a sniper, talk about my book, talk about my world record shot, and also, most importantly, talk about mental health in men, um, uh, to get him to speak out more. Uh, sad day yesterday uh, with uh, Queen Elizabeth II's funeral, and may she rest in peace. It was an honour to serve her for 23 years. Big shout out to the armed forces, who did a fantastic job yesterday. An even bigger shout out to the Household Cavalry, the Blues and Royals. Okay, they did their um, regiment proud. Been feeling good the last couple of days. Um, just finished the session with my therapist, Ross. I had my good days. And um, that's what I live for, my good days. And that's what everyone else should live for, their good days. You know, and talk. And keep talking and keep talking. And... Um, yeah, we listen. And if you've got no one to talk to, please reach out to me on my Instagram and I'll talk to you. Okay, hope everyone's well.
people are going through this and they're watching it, how can we help them? You've been in their shoes or you've been in their future shoes if they've not even got as far as that. Talking. Talking. Reach out to somebody and talk and say, this is how I'm feeling. Do not stop at the first hurdle. 